Hi, and welcome back to the Open Tech Lab. So today we're going to be talking about FPGAs. And in general, FPGAs are going to be a regular theme on this channel, and especially how they can be used with open source software. Now for those that don't know, FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. They're a really powerful kind of digital processor. Inside they're made up of an array of blocks of logic gates connected together with a tapestry of interconnects and switches. The result is that you can build any kind of digital circuitry within the device just by controlling which switches are selected through a binary bitstream which is loaded into the device. Now the Lattice ICE40 FPGA is famous for being the very first FPGA in the world to have been completely reverse engineered so that the structure of the configuration bitstream is now available in the public domain. It's also the first FPGA in the world to have a completely open source synthesis toolchain, the IceStorm toolchain. So having this completely open source toolchain presents a whole raft of possibilities for runtime firmware synthesis that have not previously been available with Lattice's proprietary tools which only run on Windows and Linux and only on Intel processors. For example, we can now synthesize firmware on an embedded device on demand rather than having to prepare a fixed binary blob in advance. Now in this video I want to introduce you to a little project I've been working on which is a Linux kernel driver for loading firmware into the Lattice ICE40 FPGA and we're going to have a little look at how to write a simple kernel driver, how it works, how it can be used, how it can be tested and how we can use open source technology and low cost hardware to do all of these things. Now before we begin, let's have a closer look at what we're trying to do here. Why is it useful to be able to load firmware to an FPGA from the kernel rather than just loading the firmware with some application running in user space? And the answer is that having a kernel driver is rather necessary if loading a firmware on the FPGA creates some devices that Linux might want to attach drivers to. For example, there might be some devices that are only accessible through the FPGA fabric or devices that are soft implemented within the FPGA itself. In either case, Linux will not be able to talk to these devices until after the firmware has been loaded. Having this capability creates the possibility of a completely new kind of multifunctional hardware where the structure can change while the device is running. Virtual devices can come and go and users can have any kind of hardware functionality they need at the time. One example of a device like this is the ICO board, which is a plug-in hat module for the Raspberry Pi, and it features the ICE40 and some RAM. And you can see in this image there's a bunch of plug-in modules which attach to the Raspberry Pi processor through the FPGA. If we want the kernel to communicate with any of these modules, the FPGA firmware will need to be loaded first. Another example is the Novena laptop, which is a laptop designed for hackers. One of its key features is a built-in Xilinx Spartan 6 FPGA which users can use to make the laptop talk to whatever hardware they're trying to hack on that day. But there's no open source toolchain for the Spartan 6 just yet though, which is a great shame. Now, the Linux kernel has only recently received support for loading FPGAs, which is the job of the FPGA Manager Framework which is a really simple framework for FPGA drivers. It can load firmware into FPGAs and it keeps track of their status. And this is the framework my driver uses, so we'll have a closer look at that in just a second. Now before we go on, I want to switch gears a little bit and explain about the Linux device tree. So the Linux device tree is one of the ways that the structure of a piece of hardware can be described to the Linux kernel. It's often used in embedded devices which don't have a built-in hardware description such as ACPI or any buses which support device discovery. A typical device tree will list all the devices in a system on chip, all the chips on a board, how they're wired up, which GPIOs are connected to what, memory addresses of different devices and interrupts and all the rest. All of this information is written in a special device tree programming language which is compiled into a binary blob ready for the kernel to use. The blob might be installed into some flash storage on the board so that the board has a built-in description of itself, or it might be provided by the bootloader, or it might even be baked into the kernel itself 
It's also possible to customise device trees with device tree overlays, which are used if the description needs a little modification. For example, if extra hardware is attached to the machine. And this is what we're going to be using to describe our hardware setup. So we're going to have a look at that in a bit more detail in just a moment. So how exactly do we go about loading the firmware? Well, the ICE40 is connected to the processor via a four-wire SPI link with clock, slave select, slave in and slave out data lines. In addition, there are two extra signals, C reset B for resetting the FPGA and C done, which it uses to say when the firmware has loaded OK. Downloading the firmware basically just consists of asserting the slave select line, pulsing the reset line for a brief period, then waiting a while for the FPGA to prepare itself. Once that's happened, then the firmware file is clocked out bit by bit over the slave, slave in data line. And if the FPGA accepts the data after checking the checksum, it will assert the C done line to say everything is OK. Then we just have to send a few extra padding bits, which tells the FPGA to activate the firmware. And that's about all we need to do to program it. So to test this driver, we need some hardware to have it running on. So in the setup I've got here today, I've wired up the six programming lines between my ICE40 evaluation board and a Raspberry Pi, which is going to run my driver. In this case, I'm going to operate the Raspberry Pi remotely over the network via SSH. Then I'm going to be using an FX2 based logic analyzer and SIGROC pulse view to spy on the firmware download process to make sure the signaling is correct. I've also wired up a couple of test lines back to the logic analyzer that the FPGA can use to signal when the firmware starts working. Now I've done a previous video about logic analyzers and SIGROCs, so if you'd like to know more, go check it out. So here's the actual setup, and you can see I've got the Raspberry Pi here wired to the ICE40 board via this breadboard in the middle, which has the junction where the signals split off to the logic analyzer. And you can also see the two test lines going from the FPGA back to the logic analyzer over here as well. Now, not every connection I need is actually exposed on the ICE40 board, so I had to do a bit of surgery to add some connection points for the clock and C done lines. Also, it's worth saying that it's not ideal having a setup with these long flying leads flying around and the breadboard as well. Uh, because there's no protection from ringing, crosstalk, pickup of stray fields, all the things that could ruin your signal integrity, parasitic capacitance and inductance and so on. But it is quick and easy to set up. And if you're aware of the dangers and you don't try and transfer too fast, you can often get away with it. But if your signals are getting corrupted or it doesn't work for no good reason, wiring like this is probably the cause. Now, just to be extra careful, I've attached the oscilloscope to the clock signal to make sure the wiring isn't causing too much distortion. So I've set the Raspberry Pi to send the clock signal in bursts at 500 kilohertz. And looking at the scope, it looks like the signal's in reasonably good shape. So I don't think we'll have any problems. Uh, there is some ringing here, but uh, it's not enough to make any spurious edges. And the rise time isn't the fastest thing in the world. Uh, but this would only cause problems if we were going uh, 20 or 30 times faster, maybe. So I think uh, if we keep to within um, uh, a couple of megahertz clock rate, I think we're not going to have any problems with the funny wiring at all. So now we've got the test set up ready, we need to construct a device tree that accurately describes the hardware. So by default, the stock device tree for the Raspberry Pi does not have the SPI bus on the pin header enabled. So if we look in the boot config text file, there are a series of variables that the bootloader uses to configure itself. And one of the things we can do here is tell Linux to enable various overlays. And we can also give various options to the overlays and to the base device tree. And there's a standard option for enabling the SPI bus. Now this option does two things, it enables the physical SPI bus hardware and it attaches a driver to it called SPI Dev. Now the purpose of SPI Dev is to expose the SPI device to user space as a character device so that applications can control the SPI bus without needing a device specific kernel driver. 
So that means that we can see the SPI slaves exposed as device nodes in the dev folder. So let's have a look at that. So if I go ls slash dev SPI star, we can see, well, there's two chip selects attached to the Raspberry Pi, and we can see them as two devices. And we can do things like feeding bytes into the uh, into the slave like this. And that's how I tested the signal integrity just now. So to begin with, our device tree overlay is going to need to go in and disable that SPI dev device driver. And that's exactly what this little template I've got here does. So it's got one fragment and that fragment targets the zeroth SPI device. And what it does is it goes in and uh, for each of the SPI slaves, zero and one, it sets the SPI dev status to disabled, which makes the SPI dev driver go away. Next up, we need to declare the presence of the FPGA. So we're looking here at the ICE40 driver bindings document, which shows uh, an example here of what the binding to the device tree should look like. And you can see it's got five lines. The first line declares that the type of device, uh, this is a, a piece of text that drivers can match on. Uh, we, the second line says which chip selects uh, in the uh, bus the device is attached to. Third line just says uh, what the maximum SPI frequency is. And the uh, fourth and fifth lines declare the GPIOs of the C done and C reset lines. So we can just go ahead and copy this block of code into the device tree overlay. So let me just paste this at the bottom here. And uh, the compatibility string stays the same. Uh, the SPI in our case is the zeroth SPI slave select, so we'll leave that value alone. I do need to fix up these two because these two uh, definitions are not going to be defined because I'm not going to bother setting up the includes properly for the device tree compiler. But with that, we have everything we need in our device tree overlay. So now we can just save and exit and compile that thing. So let's go ahead and do the compile. So we need to run the device tree compiler. Uh, this option is needed for device tree overlays. The input format is device tree source code. Uh, the output file is device tree binary file. The output file will be ice40 overlay.dtbo and the input file will be ice40 overlay.dts. There we go, and that compiled successfully. So now I'm going to copy that file onto the Raspberry Pi. So let's uh, use SCP. And then I just need to log in to the Raspberry Pi itself and copy the ICE40 overlay file into the appropriate location in the boot directory. Finally, I just need to go and uh, modify the bootloader config. So let's go to the bottom and add a DT overlay equals ICE40 overlay. Then I'll just reboot to get that uh, setting to apply then come back in a few minutes and it should have modified the device tree. So I've connected back in now the device has rebooted and we should hopefully be able to see the changes from the device tree overlay. So first of all we're expecting not to see any of those nodes from the SPI dev device driver and indeed we don't. Secondly we're hoping to see the FPGA device declared in the device tree so let's see if we can find that so it should be in sysfs Firmware, device tree, base, SOC, SPI. Now this is the bus we were modifying just now. And ICE40 at zero. And there inside that virtual directory, you can see virtual files that represent the variables uh, that we set in the overlay. So now that the FPGA has been declared in the device tree, we need a driver to make it actually do something. Now the ICE40 SPI driver is incredibly simple, it's only 214 lines long, so it's worth taking a quick look to see how it actually works. So a simple driver like this one can be defined in a single file of source code, and in a driver typically they're structured so that they flow from bottom to top. So I've scrolled down to the bottom here, and the first, the bottom thing you can see in the file is these module description uh, directives. And what these are is a bit of metadata that gets compiled in uh, to the module to define some information about it. Above this, we have a line that says this is a driver for an SPI device, and it has a reference to this structure here, 
that defines a few functions and it also defines this thing called the OF match table. Now the OF match table is a, a structure that defines what the driver is looking to attach to in an open firmware device tree. Open firmware is another name for device tree or OF for short. And uh, what it's saying is that this driver will attach to any node that has this compatibility string in it, which is exactly what we put in our device tree overlay. Next up, we have the two fundamental functions, probe and remove. Probe means uh, the function that's called when the driver attaches to a physical device and remove is when the driver is detached from a physical device. And these, uh, are, these functions are defined a little bit further up. So the probe function up here, if I scroll up, uh, doesn't have very much to do. It allocates a little bit of memory, checks the SPI bus is configured in a compatible way. It claims the GPIOs for uh, reset and C done from the device tree. And then it registers this device with the FP FPGA device manager. And that's all that we need to do for probe. And then remove, all we have to do is unregister the FPGA from the FPGA manager. Then if we scroll up a bit further to the upper half of the driver source file, uh, we encounter this FPGA manager ops structure, which defines the various functions of this FPGA manager driver. And uh, the important ones are write in it, write and write complete. And these three functions perform the actual writing operation. So let's head up and have a look at these in detail. So we've got the uh, write in it function here, and uh, that just uh, does the actual mechanics of setting the SPI, pulsing the reset bus, and so on. And then we get to the write function, and this does the job of writing out the FPGA bitstream. And after that, we have the write complete function, which uh, finishes off the transfer and uh, checks the C done line was asserted and writes out the padding, uh, padding bytes. And at this point, the FPGA should be running. And that's about all there is to this driver. So I've gone ahead and cross-compiled the ICE40 driver and I've installed it on the Raspberry Pi. So we're now in a position to test it out. So let's load it and see what happens. So sudo mod probe ICE40 SPI. And it loaded, and we can tell because if we run lsmod now, uh, you can see that in the top two lines we've got the ICE40 SPI driver and its dependency, the FPGA Manager Framework driver. Now, if we have a look at the tail end of the D message output, we can see some encouraging messages. The FPGA Manager Framework has loaded, and an ICE40 FPGA has been registered. Okay. And finally, let's have a look in sysfs. So if you go in slash sys slash uh, class fpga uh, fpga0, well, this is new. And inside we can see a few virtual files. If I do cat fpga0 slash name, you can see the lattice ice40 fpga manager. So the driver is loaded and ready to do something. So we want to get the FPGA manager to actually load some firmware for us. Now in the very near future, it will be possible to specify the FPGA bitstream file in the device tree. But unfortunately, this functionality hasn't yet been integrated into the kernel. And it's possible that at some point in future, functionality like this might be implemented, where the bitstream can be piped into a device node. Uh, but there are no plans for this uh, in the works right now. So unfortunately, the only way to load firmware right now is from within the Linux kernel by means of this internal API. This means that to actually test our FPGA driver, we're going to need to create some C code, a test module that can actually invoke this internal function. And my FPGA test module is a little hack that does exactly that. Now, if we have a look at the source code of this thing, uh, basically what happens is when it gets loaded, this function FPGA test in it gets invoked and, uh, well, it prints hello world, it finds the ICE40 FPGA in the device tree and then uh, goes ahead and just uh, causes it to load the FPGA test.bin firmware file. And that's all it does. Pretty simple and it solves the problem.
And finally, we need a little bit of test firmware so that we've got something to actually exercise the FPGA with. Uh, the Verilog uh, code here, all it does is it takes in the 12 megahertz crystal oscillator input and it feeds that into a 24-bit counter. The upper 8 bits of the 24-bit counter are used to drive the 8 LEDs, which will make them blink, and uh, the fourth bit of the counter and the inverse of the fourth bit of the counter are used to drive the two test lines. And the idea behind this is that the moment the FPGA firmware starts working, the two test lines will begin oscillating uh, in antiphase with each other. Okay, so we've got our device tree overlay installed, our driver is loaded and attached to the FPGA device node and the wiring is all connected up and we have test firmware and we have a test kernel module that we'll use to kick the FPGA driver into action. We've just got one final step to do before we're ready to test the driver and that is to set up SIGROP pulse view so we're ready to snoop on the signaling with the logic analyzer. So I've gone ahead and set up pulse view and put labels on all the signals and uh, sorted them into groups here. I'll set the sample rate to 4 megahertz uh, because I've set the SPI clock rate to 1 megahertz, and with an asynchronous logic analyzer like this one, you need to multiply the clock frequency by at least four times. And I'll set the sample count to uh, 10 mega samples, uh, which will give us two and a half seconds of capture. Now, in this case, we want to trigger off something, and the slave select line uh, seems like a reasonable choice, so I'll set that to trigger on the falling edge. I'll set the pre-trigger ratio to 20% and that, that means that 20% of the capture will happen before the trigger point and 80% will happen after the trigger point. And now I'll go ahead and click run and that will set the logic analyzer up waiting for the trigger. So all we have to do now is trigger the FPGA firmware load and to do that we're going to load the FPGA test kernel module which is in my home directory here. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, sudo insmod fpga test.ko. So when I hit go, we will commence the transfer of the firmware. And it worked, and we have Blinken lights. Now, if we have a look back at Pulse View here, we can see that we've got a nice uh, capture here ready to analyze in more detail. So let's have a closer look at what we captured here. And to begin with, we can see three things. There's the reset line getting released. There's the firmware file being transferred. And we can see it's mostly zeros, but there are some clumps of activity. And at the end of that, the FPGA asserts the C done line, saying it accepted the firmware. And at the same time, the two test lines uh, spring into action uh, because the firmware loaded and is now running. So if we zoom in a bit, here we can see the uh, reset line getting released while the slave select line is selected and this puts the FPGA into slave SPI mode and a couple of milliseconds later we can see the data transfer commencing and uh, we here we can see the bytes of the firmware file getting clocked out byte by byte. Then if we go to the end of the capture we can see the end of the file and the C done line being asserted at the end here and then you can see the seven final padding bytes here and halfway through those being sent the test lines kick in. So for one thing the FPGA is functioning the way we expect it to and for another well according to the IceStorm documentation the firmware image has a checksum embedded in it. So for those two reasons we have pretty good evidence that the firmware has been transferred perfectly. But still we have a nice capture of the transfer here so this is a good opportunity to see SIGROP decoding in action. Now, according to the iStorm documentation, the firmware file is going to begin with the hex bytes FF0000FF, followed by 7EAA997E. And if we look at the beginning of the firmware file, that's exactly what we see. So now let's add an SPI decoder in Pulse View. So to do that, we'll go into the decoders menu here and select SPI. And I'll drag this up the top so it's near the data bits. And then we need to select clock. And we don't need MISO, the slave out data, because it's not saying anything relevant to us. 
We do need slave in, so we'll select that. And it's sometimes nice to have slave select, so let's do that. And there we have it. You can see we've got the, all the bits of the transfer uh, going out to the FPGA here. And if we have a careful look at the beginning of the transfer, you can see we've got the first few bytes, FF00000FF7EAA997E, which is exactly what we were looking for. So that's an extremely good start. Now, ideally, we'd like to be able to extract the complete binary data so we can compare it to the original file. But unfortunately, PulseView doesn't yet support exporting binary decode data, but it's easy enough to do on the command line with SIGROC CLI. So if we save the session file, then we can load it back up again on the command line. So here we are on the terminal, and we're going to reload the file in SIGROC CLI. So let's just do that. Load capture.sr and we'll feed that into less. Now what we can see here is uh, the first few samples of the data file that was captured. And of course there isn't much activity because this is well before the trigger point. Now what we actually came for here was the ability to decode something. So to do that let's, uh, let's load up the file again. Uh, this time we're going to add some protocol decoder options. So we uh, basically add the same stuff that uh, uh, that we saw in in the pulse view GUI, but uh, we'll do it on the command line. Just have to carefully put everything in just right, and we want to see the mozzie data. You don't put that dash A option in, it mishmashes together every piece of information and it gets a bit hard to read. Right, so let's have a look at that. Let's see what we've got. Feed that into less. There we go, and we can see the first few bytes coming out. And we can see those lead-in bytes FF00FF70AA997E. Now we want to extract the data in binary form rather than textual form, so let's uh, go ahead and just uh, adjust the options we put in last time and this time we're going to put it in as binary output rather than ASCII output. Uh, going to select the mozzie data and let's just feed that into the hex dump and just look at the first couple of lines and there we go we can see we're getting out the binary data and we can see those magic bytes coming out again right here. Okay so now let's feed this out into a file so we'll modify the previous command and feed it into dump.bin. Now this takes a couple of minutes to complete so I'll just cut away the time it takes but uh, my computer just has to work on it for a moment. Okay that took about 30 seconds and we've got our file dump.bin out so let's have a look at that in a little more detail. So let's uh, have a look at the size of the file and you can see it's uh, 135,107 bytes long. Now if we compare that to the the original file you can see it's seven bytes longer than the original. So where's the seven come from? Well those are the seven padding bytes we put on the end. So what we really want to do is we want to strip off those seven trailing bytes which we can do with head-c-7 and uh, then we want to feed it into md5 sum so we can get a check sum of the contents. So there's that. Now let's compare this with the uh, uh, check sum of the original file. And they match. So this shows that the files are exactly the same, bit for bit. And that shows that the bits that we read off the wire with SIGROC exactly match the bits of the file that we were trying to send out. So this is even more evidence that what we're sending is perfectly correct. So now the testing is complete, the driver is nearly ready to be integrated into the mainline Linux kernel. I just have to get the driver through a few stages of review, and if it's accepted, it should be coming to you in a kernel release very, very soon. And I just want to give a big shout out to everyone who's been involved with reviewing this driver, including Merrick Vessert, Moritz Fischer, Alan Tull, Felix Held, Clifford Wolf, and Rob Herring. So as we finish up here, I'd like to do a little price check, which is something we like to do on this channel so that you can see how much things cost. Now, every piece of software used today was completely free and open source. Raspberry Pis are available for $35 new. 
The ICE-40 Evaluation Board is available from Mauser for $42.88. The jumper wires are available on eBay or AliExpress or Deal Extreme. Uh, just look out for DuPont wires or jumper wires. You can usually buy quite a large pack of these for about a dollar. Mini breadboards are 35 cents each from AliExpress, or you can get a pack of five for a couple of dollars. For the logic analyzer, search for 24 megahertz logic analyzer on eBay, AliExpress, or Deal Extreme, and you can usually find them listed for ten dollars or less. Now take care because the cheaper ones are often bundled with terrible USB cables that don't even work properly. Also be aware that these devices are clones of a product made by Sealy and the sellers often encourage you to use Sealy's logic analyzer software. Uh, that's not ethical in my opinion so just make sure you use open source Sigrox software and you'll be all good. Well, that's just about all we have time for today, but I think we covered quite a lot of ground. And if you'd like to find out more details, you can find them in the show notes, which are linked down below. And you'll be able to find the code and various other bits of information that you might find interesting. And also, if you'd like to leave any comments, and if you like the video, give it a big thumbs up and subscribe. And uh, apart from that, that's, uh, that's basically it for today. So thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time on the Open Tech Lab.